All right, all right, Red Nation. Today we're gonna to be talking about how to optimize the KVP selection on your CT scanner so you can get the best for all of your patients in terms of the image quality with respect to the amount of dose that you're using. Coming up here at How Radiology Works. So we're talking about CT. In CT, we just have really one mechanism to change the contrast, right? Besides injecting additional contrast, the mechanism we have to change the contrast in CT is to change the KVP. But that also changes other properties like the amount of penetration that we're gonna have. See our video on KVP if you haven't seen that already. A big trend in CT is the ability to go to lower KVP imaging. So for instance, if you look at these images here at a higher KVP of 120 KVP, and then if you compare that with a lower KVP of 100 KVP, especially when you're looking at idonated contrast tasks, or if you were looking at calcification or bone imaging, for instance, we've talked before about how the contrast really increases a lot for those because of the photoelectric effect. And because of that, you can see these images have significantly better contrast. We've also talked about how there is no free lunch and at lower KVPs, it is harder to penetrate larger objects. We want a method to actually help pick what the KVP is gonna be on the actual scanner itself. We don't wanna have to have a really complicated method. We're gonna have to go in there and measure something physically and do some calculations and compute in your head. What's gonna happen? We want something to happen on autopilot. If you go to this guy here, this is Willie Calendar. If you go to him, and you give them a couple pieces of information. You say, what's the body habitus of the patient? Because we talked about penetration being a huge thing for KVP, right? And then you say, what's the diagnostic task that you wanna do? Because we also talked the big area that you're gonna get improvement is with things that have a significant photoelectric contribution like iodine. And Willie could tell you roughly probably what KVP should you select? If you have a few given options, what KVP should you select? And it's not magic that he's doing that by, and it's not even some fancy new deep learning algorithm. It's actually just the physics, right? So the basic physics model can help us to calculate what KVP we should use. What we wanna optimize here is rather the dose efficiency to get a contrast to noise ratio. The contrast noise ratio is gonna depend on these things here. What's the diagnostic task? So what are the two different materials that we're gonna be looking at in that contrast task? And what is the body habitus? So how big is the object that we're trying to get through? And from those things, we can actually just use a physics model in order to compute what the KVP we should use on the system. Note that some of the other subtle things like the artifacts and the streaks, those aren't explicitly modeled here. If you remember, we talked about the dose in the CT system, and it depended strongly on things like the in-plane spatial resolution, the Z resolution. If we leave those two things constant though, then the dose actually depends on one over the variance in the image. Remember, variance is actually just the square of the standard deviation. When we talk about noise, a lot of times we're talking about the standard deviation but the variance is just the square of that. So that's the dose term. As far as the contrast term, we've talked a lot before in our previous videos on the KVP relationship, especially for photoelectric contrast, how there's really a steep increase for the lower KVPs. So you can get more contrast going to those lower KVPs. It's usually around 25% more contrast and making a jump of 20 KVP to a lower KVP, you're gonna be getting significantly more contrast. We've also talked about the penetration of the beam being an important quality. So depending on how large your object is, for a relatively small object, you're actually going to be relatively stable in terms of the noise in your image if you go to lower KVPs and give the same dose. If you have large objects, you're actually going to see a really steep increase where you get to that point where you're getting relatively fewer photons through the patient, and thus this is leading to a very noisy image. The optimization criteria 
that Willie defined in the first paper on this topic was actually called the CNRD. It's actually the contrast per given noise level. And then we have the square root of the dose in the denominator here. We took the square root of the dose because we have the standard deviation of the noise. And if you remember, that's the relationship here between those two parameters. If we have the standard deviation of the noise, then we need to take the square root of the dose because the dose went as the noise variance. That contrast divided by the noise, we can also just call that the contrast to noise ratio. We've had videos on the channel before about what contrast to noise ratio is. If we have the contrast to noise ratio, then we divide that by the square root of the dose. It's basically saying under what conditions are we going to get the best image quality for a given dose level. So now we don't have to have Willie sitting here answering the question. We can actually just use our model that says, given a body habitus and given a diagnostic task, what's going to be the best KVP based on the contrast to noise ratio per a given dose. In the first paper, what they looked at was a number of different phantoms, such as general homogeneous phantoms and phantoms that looked kind of like a chest with additional fat around the outside. And there was different tasks that they looked at. So they looked at tasks, which is basically like a density task. So not including the iodine or calcification. They looked at different sizes. So each of these different curves is a different size. And then the points are some measurements that were made for one of the smaller sizes. What you can see here is for the density task that most of the curves are pretty flat here. So there's not a really strong relationship and a KVP somewhere around 120 KVP actually gives a pretty reasonable value for all these different body sizes. And this is why for a long time, we've been using 120 KVP on our CT scanners as kind of a default because it gives a relatively good trade-off for this standard imaging. Then if you made your task calcium, now you're looking at significant amount of photoelectric effect. And you can see that it would really be beneficial to go to a lower KVP. But again, the amount that it's going to help really depends on the size of the patient. So if you have a very small patient or a neck or something like that, where you're only looking at 20 centimeters of water equivalent diameter, then the optimal KVP is way down here around 50 KVP. And then similar behavior seen for iodine tasks also where again, there's significant difference between the size of the patient and in general, especially for the smaller patients, for the smaller habitus, there's really a benefit to going to the lower KVP settings. And some work that was being done basically in parallel, I think, was at the Mayo Clinic, where a similar study is being done. In this case, it's phantoms, and you take the same base phantom contrast material and you put it inside of larger and larger objects. Let's see, so you can see here, things start to get a little bit blurrier out here when the object gets really large because there's some low signal going on within the image. Then you can measure quantities of the image quality. In the case of the Mayo study, they actually looked at basically the square of what Willie was looking at, and they did it normalized to a given reference KVP. So in this case, 120 KVP was the reference. And then for all the other KVPs, a relative number was plotted, which is basically how much dose is going to be expended in order to get that same CNR. So if you get a number which is less than one, that's good because it's less dose that you have to use. You get a number which is more than one, that's bad because it's more dose you would have to use. For the soft tissue task, you can see the curves are more flat, but for relatively larger patients, it becomes actually disadvantageous to use the lower KVPs because those lower KVPs are not able to adequately penetrate. You can see there is significant difference here based on the patient size. That's why we need a method to actually estimate the patient size and use that in this selection. Then the next one they looked at is a soft tissue plus a small amount of contrast in the imaging task. 
of iodinated contrast. So in general, that's going to push the KVP selection lower. And you can see now 100 KVP is better overall. But again, there's significant difference between the given sizes. So you'd want to make your selection on a patient-by-patient -patient basis based on the task. Finally, if it's an angio task, then you're really pushing towards those lower KVPs where you can get significant dose savings. So if you see here the number is 0.5, that means you only need half of the dose that you would have needed at 120 KVP. One of the things that really is enabling these techniques on modern CT scanners is actually improvements in tube technology. So historically, we could have said we'd like to image at lower KVP because of the benefits that we have there for iodine imaging, but we couldn't get enough MA in order to take those images in a reasonable amount of time. The scans would have been very slow if we wanted to get enough MA. As you boil off electrons from a coiled wire, you can get space charge limitations in the amount of electrons that will build up right around that coiled wire. This is not the case if you use a flat field emitter where you can actually have a significantly bigger area here and then we can actively pull those electrons across on modern x-ray tubes such as the Quantix x-ray tube by GE. So that really allows the vendors to go from relatively lower MAs that were achievable at these low KVPs and go up by several factors to really high MA levels. You don't have to be worried when you see an MA that's like a thousand, right? You kind of feel bad because that MA number seems so high. But remember, in all these cases, we're actually doing this because we're optimizing and we're actually saving on total dose. If you remember our video on the actual relationship for the dose between the parameters, the KVP is a power law and it goes up much more quickly than the MA. So even though we're adjusting the MA up significantly, we can be doing so and still be saving dose for the patient. So the ability to know your diagnostic task, to estimate the size of the patient, that can be done with just a scout or topogram image. And then to use those things in order to optimize the contrast to noise per a given dose, that's how KVP selection is done on your modern systems. It's great that you now understand how KVP is actually selected on the CT systems. Make sure and see our video next on the KVP itself so that you'll understand those relationships for contrast and penetration as a function of KVP. Coming up next.